welcome viewers. So, today we will see the contributions of uh, sophists in Greek philosophy. In the previous lecture we have highlighted the contributions of uh, the early uh, Greek thinkers who are called the pre-Socratic thinkers and uh, that constituted the first phase of Greek philosophy. And in this lecture we will focus on the second phase which is uh, rather very important as far as the history of western philosophy is concerned. So, we will see the contributions of sophist in the history of human thinking particularly in the history of western philosophy. So, these are the topics which we are going to cover in this lecture the impact of philosophical thinking in the Greek world which has ultimately led to the emergence of sophism. Then we will see the sophist what constitute or rather most important characteristic feature of sophist. Then uh, the emergence of sophism the reasons behind the emergence of sophism particularly political and cultural factors that uh, propelled their emergence. Then we will see uh, some of the major contributions or some of the major views of uh, the sophist which can be summarized uh, with an explanation of what skepticism was and what relativism was for the sophist. And then we will have uh, uh, started we will focus on the contributions the individual contributions of uh, two of the important sophists Gorgias and uh, Protagoras. And then uh, we will uh, summing up we will see the impact of sophism in uh, European thought particularly on morality and on the nature of philosophical reflections and then the contributions of sophist. So, these are the topics which uh, we are going to discuss also we will have a note on the drawbacks of sophism some of the major drawbacks of uh, uh, sophism as a movement. So, let us uh, begin our examination of the contributions the philosophical thinking of sophist. So, we will have to begin with an analysis of the impact of philosophical thinking which is emerged in the Greek world with Thales we have already examined this in the previous lecture. So, this is uh, uh, the philosophical approach to reality uh, questions the accepted customs and conventions naturally because philosophy is a critical inquiry. So, it never accept things as it comes as it is said. So, it questions it inquires what is the reason behind things. So, this is both a philosophical inquiry as well as a scientific inquiry to be critical not to accept anything as it is given, but to examine whether it is true or not whether it is valid or not. So, one has to be critical about customs about views about perspectives and about standpoints and to think logically this is another thing which distinguish we have already seen that distinguish philosophical inquiry from other inquiries that philosophical inquiry is logical it follows reason and uh, old conceptions of the world and life were transformed profoundly by this philosophers the pre-socratic thinkers they have questioned they have introduced new problems for the human intellect to ponder upon. So, the old conceptions were uh, transformed profoundly which which is predominantly the old uh, conceptions were predominantly mythological religious in nature. So, these are all transformed and uh, placed in new perspective of reason and science and mysticism gave way to science and philosophy. So, we have mapped this emergence of science and philosophy in the previous lecture. Now, the spirit of free inquiry permitted other fields as well. So, this is one important thing because the emergence of philosophy has actually given birth to an emergence of a new culture in, in the Greek world. So, every field of human activity were affected for example, poetry, history, the understanding of history because normally you know this pre modern civilizations they their understanding of history is uh, based on oral traditions whatever is handed down from generation to generation. So, based on certain beliefs and conventions and customs, so, but with this emergence of scientific philosophical spirit there is a different approach altogether to all intellectual disciplines humankind is concerned with. So, the more important thing is we have to see the emergence of medicine as a science in the Greek world rather than the healing practices of ancient physicians 
which are not based on any codified rational knowledge. Medicine as a science, as a universal science based on certain principles and also based on observation of physicians, individual physicians emerge during this period. So, let us see the some very briefly the contribution, see here we can see the free enquiry which is being prompted, which is being supported and encouraged by philosophical thinking. And in the world of poetry we will see great poets like Sophocles, Euripides, Sophocles the great writer of uh, Oedipus, the great uh, uh, dramatician and uh, such a kind of changes the Greek civilization has undergone in creative domains. And when in history we have people like Herodotus and uh, Thucydides and medicine, this is what I said more importantly in the field of medicine we have Hippocrates. So, Hippocrates is considered as a father of uh, medical sciences, even now some of his views and observations are relevant and considered as uh, important in by modern scientists. So, this is the context in which sophism emerged in Greek uh, history. <coughs> now, when you talk about the sophist, who are they? Sophists are professional educators. So, till then there was no such conception of professional education in the sense that there are a group of people who are equipped with certain skills and certain, certain professional knowledge based on which they can advise people in the society and train people, impart skills to the people who require them. So, and also in turn they accept money, so that is their livelihood, so it is all done for money based on a fee. So, sophists were largely professional educators, they were walking teachers, they never settled down in a particular place, they will go around who taught young people the art of rhetoric. So, rhetoric becomes important at this phase of Greek history and rhetoric is a science particularly, rhetoric as a science has been practiced by these people, sophists, they, they, they perfected it and uh, trained young people in the fine mechanisms of rhetoric, sophistry means practical wisdom. So, when you examine the, the etymology of the term sophist, it, it means practical wisdom, they do not claim that they have any special knowledge about the metaphysical realities of this universe. Like the pre-Socratic thinkers we have seen in the previous lecture, where talking about that what is that fundamental substance out of which everything is come out, such metaphysical questions were not entertained by the sophist they rather focused on practical wisdom, practical wisdom which is needed for living in this society, for negotiating with people in the society and for winning, for actually gaining a success in this social life. How to succeed in life? So, that is a very practical question which sophists were concerned about. In a society where you find yourself how to succeed, how to have a good career that is the question, how to win any argument, now they come to the point, how to win any argument regardless of the side they took, this is because no truth is universally valid. So, here you can see their so called quote unquote metaphysical position as well, which says that no truth is universally valid, which is relativism. So, the, the practical most practical question is how to win any arguments regardless of the side they took. And what they said is that do not constitute a movement of tradition of thought, see this is something which we have to understand from the very outset. Sophist is not a school of thought like rationalism or empiricism are schools of thought, they do not constitute a, a movement even like a group of people come together and, and pursue certain common objectives and do certain things on the base of certain common understanding, so, nothing like that. For sophist it was not like that, it was not a tradition of thought, then there is no common metaphysical doctrine though there are several common features. So, you in, in a school of thought you will find some very strong basis, whether it is metaphysical or epistemological position, which you would not find in the case of sophist. Again uh, when we talk about uh, some, there are, there are several sophists, their names uh, uh, are mentioned in, uh, in, in literature, in, in philosophy, 
in philosophical literature, particularly in the works of Aristotle, Plato and, and many others. But we would be considering only two of them, uh, but when you uh, the, uh, the first one is Gorgias and the second one is Protagoras. And there is also one important uh, sophist whose name is being mentioned very frequently it is Isocrates, but of course, we will not be dealing with his philosophy in this lecture. So, when we talk about these two sophists who, whom I mentioned Gorgias, uh, what is associated famously associated with this thinker is this thesis of nihilism, nothing exists it is called nihilistic skepticism. And when it comes to Protagoras the most important and the most famous and the most popular saying which has become the hallmark of sophism is associated with Protagoras which says that man is a measure of all things. So, again now when we talk about the emergence of sophism let us have a very brief understanding about this aspect as well. What led what are the conditions which ultimately led to the emergence of sophism. So, we will basically concentrate on two aspects one is the political one the second one is the cultural one and when we deal with the political one we can see that it is emerged as the aftermath of Athens and other city states in Greece adopting democracy. So, politically democracy is, is what made sophist relevant and effective public speaking as a result of as a consequence of uh, democracy effective public speaking can fetch a good career in democratic politics. So, public speaking becomes very important in democracy, because what is important in democracy is to convince others through arguments that you have a point. This is what is happening in even, even in today's democratic world that politicians are they, they, they come uh, with the help of media and various other platforms they come to the people and there is a public debate about issues and uh, to what extent politicians are capable of convincing people that they are good. It is based on that their success depends. So, in democracy we can imagine what would have been the case in the ancient Greece with uh, the city states which are very small states and the population is not very large where people even know each other in such a case they have given a lot of importance to this skills the speaking skills. And sophist were teachers who taught rhetoric and other forms of art that help excel uh, political life. So, they were teaching excellence in one sense we can say that certain skills that enable people to come to the public platform and convince their views to the public and engage in an argument with others with their opponents with their counterparts. And, uh, uh, and again you know in the political side the Philippinesian war also has prompted or uh, propelled the growth of sophism and contact with other cultures gave them the exposure to doubt the legitimacy of their own beliefs and convictions. That is another thing because one uh, particular uh, idea of uh, the sophist were relativism, they do not believe in one single theory, one single idea, one single position. So, they were relativist that is because of their exposure with other civilizations, other cultures. When you are exposed to other people, you are exposed to different ways of seeing the world, different practices and different customs. This rather prompt you to accept that or rather to accept your contingency that what whatever you believe your customs and conventions are not the truth. There could be other ways of seeing reality and understanding the world. And uh, again uh, democratic institutions encouraged independent thought and action that is one hallmark of democracy independent action thought. So, where people there is a desire to power and power is always associated with wealth, fame, efficiency and success. So, all these things are required see the important thing to be noted here is that uh, success will never come as a matter of hereditary. It is not given to you it is something which is achieved by your skills and for sharpening your skills your abilities you need to be trained in a particular way and sophists were precisely offering that training uh, to the public. Growth of individualism as a result of the critical attitude and free thinking. So, this is another impact of uh, this critical thinking that 
individualism grows, people start differentiating or rather distancing themselves from commonly held beliefs and customs. So, there is a common pool of beliefs, people each individual who is capable of independent thought starts questioning it and distancing himself or herself from those accepted views. Now, when we see the cultural aspect, the growth of philosophical and scientific thinking prompted them to think of human progress in rational terms. Human progress is not something which is dictated by the gods, not something which is dictated by the divine powers, but something which man can achieve in this world. So, philosophical thinking, the growth of philosophical thinking, rational thinking has helped them to conceive human progress from that perspective, from a very optimistic humanistic perspective, man can fashion his destiny. That is some strongest uh, confident uh, philosophical viewpoint, standpoint which these thinkers were adopting. Education and training play important roles, as I already mentioned it is not something which is given to you as a matter of uh, being born in a particular family, but something which you have to achieve through education and training. And as a result, two important characteristic features can be identified of sophism. The first one is skepticism, never accept anything in its face value, question everything, doubt everything. There are no fundamental positions possible, so everything can be doubted and the second one is relativism. That is again a kind of uh, approach to, 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 the, to life and reality, where you see that there is no ultimate fundamental perspective from where reality can be grasped in, a, in an absolute sense. Everything is relative to perspectives. Doubting the possibility of true knowledge, that is one of the consequences of this skepticism, because true knowledge depends on something which is, which is fixed, something which is a sense we can call. But here these people oppose all possibilities of such an essentialistic foundationalistic philosophy. So, doubting the possibility of true knowledge again questions the authority of moral law, that is another one. Moral law, moral law is again there is a conception of moral law which is which underlies the Greek world, that moral law is something like uh, the natural law which cannot be violated, which is so naturally there, it is natural quote unquote which cannot be violated, should not be violated. But here these people with their skepticism, with their relativism questions the very sanctity of such a moral law which is universal and objective. Refutation of objectivity in all fields particularly in the field of knowledge and in the field of morals. So, attacked religious and other customary values, so their conceptions are very peculiar in that way and again moral values have not emanated from God, they are human creations. So, this is another very important uh, uh, starting point, I would call it starting point, because you know these people have already set aside everything that has been accepted by tradition and they want a new beginning. So, moral values, one of the important conceptions about moral values is that they are given by gods, they are divine creations you are not supposed to violate it, because God has already instituted it, but these people say that it is not the creation of God, they are created by man, human beings have created it. Now, let us examine uh, two important uh, philosophers of the sophist, and I will first go to Gorgias, and here I will just take an example uh, of one of the arguments he has initiated, which is depicted by Plato, but before that the major theory uh, which, propon which is proponent by, by, by Gorgias is nothing exists. So, as I have already mentioned earlier, his philosophical position can be termed as nihilistic skepticism, nothing exists. If and this is an argument, this is actually given by uh, Plato, if something does exist we cannot know it, even if we can know it we cannot communicate it about the gods, I am not able to know whether they exist or do not exist, nor what they are like in form, for the factors preventing knowledge are many. So, this is uh, a view which is attributed to 
to Protagoras as well some, some scholars, but uh, largely you know when you follow the logic uh, which is developed by Gorgias in his, uh, in his nihilistic skepticism, he begins with the thesis that nothing exists. If anything exists, it must be either being or not being or both being and not being that is another uh, uh, step. So, we are advancing the argument is being advanced, if anything exists it must be either being or not being or both being and not being, it cannot be not being for not being does not exist, but if that is the case if it did it would be at the same time being and not being which is impossible which is a contradiction. So, one possibility is ruled out, it cannot be being for being does not exist, if being exist it must be either everlasting or created or both. So, now another argument if at all being exist it must be either everlasting or created, if it is created it is not everlasting because it has a beginning. Now, it cannot be everlasting because if it were it would have no beginning and therefore, would be boundless. Now, if it is boundless then it has no position would be nowhere for if it had position it would be contained in something. So, this is another one if it is boundless then it has no position because boundless cannot be contained anywhere for if it has a position it would be contained in something and so it would no longer be boundless. If it is contained in something else then you cannot call that object boundless because there is something in which it is contained which is greater than this for that which contains is greater than that which is contained and nothing is greater than boundless. So, you come across a contradiction here, this is a way these people develop their arguments, they use language a lot and show that you contradict and this contradiction will result in a kind of truth, the clash of contradicting ideas will, will result in the emergence of truth, this is what these people believed. It cannot be contained by itself for then the thing containing and the thing contained would be the same and being would become two things both position and body which is absurd. Again that possibility is also ruled out, if not contained then it would not have any position at all then it does not exist. So, all the possibilities are ruled out hence if being is everlasting it is boundless, if boundless it has no position which means that it is nowhere, if without position it does not exist. So, here what it does is this is what I have already mentioned use two arguments which may oppose each other. So, you give two possibilities and two arguments which may apparently contradict each other allow them to clash, now you make them clash and this may result in the emergence of truth. So, this is a method these people adopt. And uh, in the light of this when we examine Gorgias philosophical position, we can see that he is a master rhetoric, he is a master of rhetoric and a master rhetoric, refutation of the theory of being proposed by Parmenides. So, this is what uh, we can understand because one of the greatest pre-Socratic thinkers Parmenides which we have already examined in the previous lecture had shown that he has he had a conception of reality which is immovable, which is a boundless being he calls it being boundless being which is immovable, which is imperishable, which is eternal such a conception is being refuted by the sophist by Gorgias with this nihilistic skepticism. So, it is a refutation of the theory of being proposed by Parmenides and uh, is a major propounder of the idea of paradoxical thought and paradoxical expression. So, you can see they, they bring about or rather they put forth with certain, certain paradoxes, that is what I said they allow contradictions to clash, oppositions to clash and paradoxical expressions also. So, we can see that in this sense Gorgias is not primarily a philosopher of excellence, a teacher of excellence or uh, 
uh, excellence or virtue like many other sophists. As I already mentioned many of these sophists were walking teachers, they trained people uh, uh, in excellence, uh, how to be excellent, how to, how to succeed in life. So, they were teachers of excellence and virtue, but Gorgias in that pure sense of the term is not a teacher of excellence or virtue. He believed that there is no absolute notion of excellence of, or virtue, that is another, another important thing, because there is no such absolutism present in Gorgias philosophical position. He is a thorough going relativist or nihilist, they are relative to the situation and context. So, excellence in one context need not be an excellence in other context. So, that makes the uh, space for relativism and again he refutes a representationalist conception of language, that is that's another very important contribution of, of the sophist by and large of the sophist and particularly Gorgias uh, from the perspective of contemporary philosophy. Why I mention contemporary philosophy, because now we talk a lot about postmodernism and we can see that postmodernism as a movement or as a philosophical position refutes some of the fundamental assumptions of modernity and the most important one is the, the belief in uh, a kind of transcendental reason, which people like Immanuel Kant uh, propagate. The, the kind of a rationality, the rational principle, transcendental universal objective reason. So, the postmodernists refute that without really subscribing to a relativistic position, because what most of the postmodernists were trying to do is to overcome the dichotomy between rational and irrational. So, there is no question of relativism and this is generally the trend, generally the spirit of contemporary philosophy. I am not saying that all contemporary philosophers are relativist or all contemporary philosophers are postmodernist, no that is not the case. There are many others like people like Habermas who are not, who are who oppose the postmodernism, but all of them accept that language plays a very important role in constituting reality. It is not that language is just a representation of reality that is their outside world. So, the words which you use are not just names of objects in the world, this is what representationalism is. Representationalists believe that words are mere signs or symbols of objects in the world. So, these people we can find a refutation of such a conception of language present in, in Gorgias philosophical position as well, where language can do more than merely representing reality. Actually language can create a reality, this is what they say. And, uh, Language has uh, seductive powers, this is something which uh, um, all, many of the sophists were interested to explore. Language has certain powers, they can seduce people, words may have incantatory and narcotic effects on an audience. So, this is uh, very beautifully depicted by Shakespeare in his uh, uh, Julius Caesar, where uh, after the death of Caesar, uh, Mark Antony comes and mesmerizes people, his audience and with a rhetoric speech he delivers. So, we can see language has seductive powers, the idea comes from the sophist, a skilled rhetorician can prove any proposition. So, this is interesting, you can prove any argument, you can, you can put forward proof for any argument. We may say something and mean something else, this is all possible in language, language has a force to lead, I mean if at all there is something called truth it is language which takes us to that truth, language which takes us to reality. And uh, when we talk about the Gorgian impact from this perspective, the youth were attracted to his position naturally, somebody who comes and denies, somebody who propagates nihilistic skepticism, uh, the position will be definitely attractive to the youngsters particularly, because it is at that age you, you sort of develop opposition to tradition, conventions and customs. There is no truth out there, we can make it. This is another important uh, uh, sophistic position. There is no truth out there, we make it and uh, we can uh, get training for this. So, you can actually sharpen your skills, your abilities with the help of certain trainings and imparting certain skills. And success is not something that comes as an hereditary right, it is achieved through skills. So, this is a very optimistic belief which, which youngsters would have and naturally Gorgias and other sophists attracted them. But 
Now, there are certain concerns which need to be raised in this context. The first one is does this amount to corrupting the youth, because you know you, you deny the validity of any position. So, does it amount to a kind of corrupting the youth, does this nihilism invalidates all position all truth ultimately leading to complete nihilism, complete chaos. So, these are some of the concerns no position is more correct for these people and uh, these are some of the uh, important aspects about gorgeous philosophy. Now, we come to the, uh, the second one second philosopher whom I have mentioned Protagoras with whom the most important expression associated with the sophistic movement is associated what is it man is the measure of all things. So, there are two aspects to this proposition first one is it, it asserts relativism the second one is it propagates humanism because it talks about man man is being the ultimate measure of everything there is no gods no reference to any extra human beings here rather man and on the other hand what is this man who is this man whether it is a human community whether it is humanity as a whole no for the sophist it is the individual it is the individual man and so relativism actually it is subjectivism. So, these two aspects need to be understood before we proceed further. Gorgias was not a teacher of virtue as I already mentioned, but Protagoras was and he advocated the idea of uh, it is a Greek word disoil logai or different words. There are two contradictory sides of every issue. So, highlighting the two sides of every issue. So, you begin with both the sides and train students to see both these sides and argue accordingly. So, what basically Protocolus says is that there is no one issue which is correct than the other one. You can for on any issue or any problem on any given situation you can find two opposing contradicting viewpoints and you cannot say that one of these viewpoints is more correct than the other. And uh, Protagoras was training his students to argue for each of these positions, each of this viewpoint. One can through the employment of such techniques make the weaker cause appear stronger. So, you can even prove that at 12 o'clock in the noon in a market place a philosopher goes and announces that it is midnight now, there is no light it is darkness and it is midnight now it is obviously against what you perceive, but then through argumentation through such large rhetorics you can ultimately prove that it is midnight. So, this is the way these people have taken their philosophy to understand things from a lighter beam, but of course, there are serious implications to this, this such a conception. Now, when you say man is a measure of all things you are focusing on man the, as I already mentioned the focus is not on human communities or humanity as such, but on the individual man and it is not on reason which is which is the universal element that is present in all men. So, when we talk about reason we are talking about something which is universally present in all human beings across cultures and civilizations, but here with a focus on individuality the, the rational element is bracketed it is kept aside and you, you isolate the individual the individual the concrete individual with this concrete historical environment becomes at the center of philosophical inquiry. Focus on the individual knower knowledge depends on particular knower. So, that is what knowledge is associated not with reason which is universal or with humanity, but with the particular knower there is no objective truth what is true to me is true to me and what is true to you is true to you. So, there is no such universal objective platform based on which you can arrive at a transcendental conception of truth. Individual is a law unto himself on matters of knowledge. So, everything is dictated decided by the individual there are no universal standards. Now, based on this let us have an analysis of the impact of sophism in, in human uh, intellectual history, individualism and relativism as I have already mentioned and uh, no objective truth and objective knowledge 
only subjective opinions. Each individual is a measure of his truth. So, there is no possibility for truth and knowledge in the traditional sense of the term. There are only opinions, opinions of individuals. Again, no compulsion to conform to the universe. That gives you uh, immense freedom, because there is no compulsion at all that your views should conform to something which is there, something which is universal. Everything is tentative, everything is personal, all positions are equally true. So, this is what it looks very attractive that every position is true, every man is correct, every viewpoint is equally true and uh, it refuted the rational and foundationalistic tradition of Greek thought. You can see that the pre-Socratic thinkers whom we have examined in the previous lecture, they were all sort of subscribed to a conception of rational knowledge, a kind of foundationalistic perspective that it is possible uh, that or rather there is a reality which is absolute and it is possible for man to understand this reality with the employment of reason. So, these are some of the ideas which are present in the Greek civilization and these were defeated, refuted by the sophist. Now, when we see this foundationalism of the Greek thinkers, what are they? The world as rationally ordered by laws that could be discovered by reason and observation. There is a word which is rationally ordered which can be understood by human mind with the employment of observation and reason, scientific, philosophical, rational approach to understand the world, the possibility that possibility is refuted. The laws of that cosmos can be discovered by the application of individual reason. So, human mind which possesses reason has the ability to understand truth, see the optimism. The tradition of argumentation, a cost to discover truth. So, these people believed in a tradition of argumentation. So, something which I mentioned in the previous lecture, the, the we call, they call it a, a tradition of critical discourse that is being undermined by the sophists, because argumentation is meant for what? To arriving at truth, but if there is no objective truth, then what is the point in argument? So, argumentation, the very idea of engaging in arguments, the very idea of logical argumentation becomes a futile exercise. Sophist countered all these assumptions and advocated ethnocentricism and subjective views. Ethnocentric means that there is no universally valid morals or conceptions of knowledge or values, but everything is dependent on certain concrete historical social factors or individual factors. So, subjective views, cultural relativism and individualism. Now, as I already mentioned, the entire sophistic movement had the, its major impact on morality and which is the most serious impact, which, which one has to understand. And we can see that this is actually uh, the, the, we can see the emergence of uh, all kinds of relativism from the sophist position, cultural relativism, moral realism, moral uh, in individualism and uh, subjectivism, all kinds of even nihilism from the sophist perspective. The most affected domain and the most important impact, so that is why the impact on morality is the most affected domain of human concern is morality. And they questioned the objective and foundational moral theories. Again, morality is nothing more than conventions for them. So, there is no ground, universal ground which anyone can accept, it has just become what a matter of convention and questioned all accepted assumptions about what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. So, everything that the society, the culture, the civilization has considered as valuable has been questioned by these these walking teachers of ancient Greece. Now, uh, moral law, nature and function, moral laws are like laws of nature, I have already mentioned this, that the, the conception, the original conception of a moral law is to compare it with a law of nature, where uh, they are universally true for all human beings. So, there is a kind of universalism and objectivism and this universal law can be understood by reason. 
So, you man can understand it. So, since man can understand it, it is possible for man to uh, be good or bad, right or wrong and sophist refuted all these. So, this is what uh, uh, sophists have taken us and when we talk about moral foundationalism, moral laws are, are like as just to sum up laws of nature universally true for all humans, universal law can be understood by reason and moral skepticism says that it is created by man based on circumstances, no independent objective existence and vary from time to time and place to place and even from individual to individual. So, moral foundationalism versus moral skepticism. And again, uh, as I already mentioned, sophists would see morality as a matter of convention. According to some of them, uh, morals or morality represents the will of those who have the power to enforce their demands on others. That is one view. So, moral views are contrary to, they would say that they are contrary to nature, they cannot be compared with natural laws, they are contrary to nature and laws are made by the weak, that is another view. So, I am just presenting that there are different views possible and different sophists held different views about morality. According to some, it is, it is those who have the in power enforce them and that has become right, that has become just and according to some others, laws are made by the weak, the majority in order to restrain the strong from overpowering them. You can see that this resonance of such a view in the philosophy of Nietzsche uh, late 19th century. Natural right is the right of the strong, according to this view they, they would say that natural, what is natural is uh, 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 the interest of the strong. And uh, now we will we'll address a very, very concrete question, the notion of justice. I am taking up this question because this is going to occupy a major space in the discussion, the philosophical uh, pos discussion of the philosophical position of uh, two great philosophers, uh, Plato and Aristotle in the subsequent lectures. So, the question of justice is, uh, is initiated here and here there is an interesting view put forward, might is right, accident makes might. There is no universal factor which decides and determines what is right, it is just accident that makes might and might is right and this is held by Callicles. Another sophist called uh, Thrasymarchus would say that might makes right. So, there is an argument here the nature and origin of justice which is, uh, uh, which is narrated by Plato in his Republic book 2. What it says is that they say that to do injustice is by nature good, to suffer injustice evil, but that the evil is greater than the good and so when men have both done and suffered injustice and have had experience of both not being able to avoid the one and obtain the other, they think that they had better agree among themselves to have neither. Hence, there arise laws and mutual convenience and that which is ordained by law is termed by the lawful and just. So, it says that the primary assumption is this that to do injustice is by nature good and to suffer injustice is evil. So, if I take advantage over another person by stealing his computer or pen or something, I am doing injustice to him, but that is good for me. But for that person suffering injustice is evil. So, but it is not possible for human beings in normal circumstances to, to always experience good, experience pleasure. So, what they have done is they have come to an agreement to do away with both, both justice and injustice. So, this they affirm to be the origin and nature of justice, it is a mean of compromise justice is nothing but a mean, a compromise between the best of all, which is to do injustice and not to be punished, to do injustice and get away with that, not to be punished, but that is not possible, that is not humanly possible, because if I do injustice another person suffer injustice and there is a possibility that I might be caught, then the consequences will be very bad. So, what I do is that, since I do not want that to happen. I have decided to arrive at a compromise with everyone in the society, 
which is to do injustice and not to be punished and the worst of all which is to suffer injustice without the power of retaliation. And justice being a middle point between the two is tolerated not as a good, but as a lesser evil and honored by reason of the inability of men to do injustice. For no man who is worthy to be called a man would ever submit to such an agreement if he were able to resist he would be mad if he did. So, this is the position about justice. I repeat the last line for no man who is worthy to be called a man would ever submit to such an agreement this, this sort of a compromise if he were able to resist he would be mad if he did. And the best way to leave the sophist conclude is in seeking pleasure or the good life is the pleasurable life and if the best life is the pleasurable life then injustice is more profitable than justice provided you do not get caught, you get away with that. Most people would take advantage of their neighbors if they were certain they would get away with it. So, this is that conclusion. So, they do not believe in any, any fundamental positions, moral positions and this is something which sophists take us kind of moral relativism, moral skepticism and moral nihilism which we would find in subsequent lectures how people found it objectionable and, and try to counter it particularly uh, people like uh, Plato and Aristotle. And now to sum up we will see some of the important contributions of sophist they brought philosophy as this is uh, Cicero's opinion philosophy down from heaven to the dwelling of men from issues like what is the ultimate substance, what is the fundamental substance, whether change is real or permanence is real all such highly intellectual abstract issues philosophy was concerned with. These sophists brought them down to earth to the problems of man to individual man and focus on man the individual man turned attention from external nature to man himself. Now, man becomes the, the object of philosophical inquiry. Man becomes man occupies the center of philosophical contemplations here, expose some long standing conventions and beliefs about the possibility of objective universal knowledge. Rather they question the very, very concept of such a knowledge, such knowledge and truth which are universal, which are, which are transcendental and questioned some of the long standing assumptions and conventions, open way for a theory of knowledge. If knowledge is so shaky, if knowledge is nothing but based on certain conventions, then you have to think about and naturally this has, this has led to a kind of chaos, this has led to a lot of controversies and subsequent thinkers have invested a lot of time on examining the nature and function of knowledge. So, theory of knowledge as a discipline emerged out of this, this kind of a crisis which, which the sophists have taken us, added a different dimension to moral reflections unwillingness to accept conventional assumptions. So, moral reflections which were present which were based on certain, certain assumptions about right and wrong good and bad were, were questioned by these thinkers. Again criticism of morality led to a more profound reflection in the field of ethics and morality. So, now onwards you can see that philosophers take up this problem and we will find that for Plato the most important issue is the concept of justice that is at the center of philosophical problems. And even today ethics is a major concern for philosophers and this has begun from sophist, promoted free thinking and critical thinking, forced more studies in the field of political philosophy, theories of justice, theories about state, theories about the authority, the concept of authority and laws of the state etcetera, etcetera. So, these are the new avenues, new study domains which the sophist forced open for further inquiries. And before we wind up, we will have a very brief look at the drawbacks which will actually take us to the next section which we will discuss in the next lecture. They failed to see the universal element in man, they were emphasizing on the individual, on the subjective and failed to see the universal they exaggerated the differences in human judgments and ignored the agreements. 
they magnified the accidental, the subjective and personal elements in human knowledge and totally neglected the universal aspects. The critic of traditional morality collapsed into subjectivism and individualism and further to pure selfishness and moral anarchy. That is a situation which we will find when Socrates arrives into the scene. Promoted disrespect and disobedience to the law, neglect of civil duty and selfish individualism. So, these are some of the very very sad consequences, very objectionable consequences of the sophistic movement and they threat to community life with stress on selfish interest of the individual over conceptions of general welfare of the city. Now, with this we will go to the next step in the next lecture. We can see that there is a mixed response to the sophist, sophists generally definitely have, have raised some very important questions and their contributions are immense no doubt about it. Without sophist probably some of these important issues which we discuss in philosophy today would never have taken up at all. And uh, concern for the law, state authority and public welfare was something which prompted later philosophers to counter the positions of sophist and uh, there is a concern for reason because these people have totally done away undermined the role of reason in the pursuit of truth and knowledge. And here comes the very important role of one of the greatest thinkers in human thought Socrates, the gadfly, the intellectual midwife which we will discuss in the next lecture to restore faith in human reason. In the next lecture we will see the contributions of Socrates and other important philosophers. For now, thank you.